In deep water off the southwest coast of England lie three unknown German submarines from the Second World War. Exactly which ones are they? What happened to their crews? Why are they here? And how did they meet their end? Now at last, advances in diving techniques allow definite answers. There is really nothing more satisfying than actually going to an unidentified wreck and working out what it is. For the first time, divers uncover a secret military operation, reveal the identities of the mystery U-boats, and finally disclose the true fate of their crews. Off the southwest of England are numerous sunken vessels. Seven miles out, two lie side by side. Highly unusual, only a dive can determine what caused them both to go to the bottom in the same place. Finding two wrecks together is an extremely rare event. Normally, you would expect there to be some sort of association between them whether they've collided, hit the same reef, the same rock, been caught by the same weather conditions. It has been known for shipwrecks to be right beside each other, but there tends to be a reason for it. The answer lies over 60 meters down, a full 200 feet, until recent innovations in equipment and techniques, this depth would have defeated divers. The first wreck they encounter appears to be a small cargo vessel. The first time we dived the ship, we noticed that she was very broken up, very flattened, lying on the port side, very little sticking out of the seabed. The bottom of the hull had been hit and bent back. We're not sure by what. It could be a collision or something on the surface. She's just so badly corroded and beaten up, it's just impossible to identify her. Close by appears the characteristic shape of a German submarine. You could tell that it was a classic German U-boat. She had a massive dent just after the conning tower, a complete rupture of the pressure hull. Just such an awesome amount of damage. The two wrecks are so close together, the divers are initially misled into assuming the fates of both are in some way connected. I really reckon she was rammed. I really, really do. It just looks so much like something's hit it, run up, sort of sliced the top of it, and then pushed the whole sub down, yeah. and that's given the pounding as, yeah. as, as the rest of the weight of yeah. the ship would yeah. hit it. That would definitely Either that sense. or she hit a mine halfway down on the side. The fact that one of the wrecks is a submarine is a real surprise. And given her German origin, her presence raises further questions. What was she doing so close to the coast of Britain? In both world wars, these underwater weapons proved powerful and successful. None play a more critical role than the submarines of the German Navy. The U-boat fleet inflicts widespread losses. The submarine menace strikes more fear into Allied hearts than attacks from surface ships. After a slow start, U-boat production goes into overdrive. Led by Admiral Dönitz, their wolf pack tactics threaten to starve Europe of essential supplies. In the Battle of the Atlantic, Britain's very existence hangs in the balance. With confirmation that one of the wrecks is a submarine, the hunt is now on as to her identity. Penzance-based historian and diver Innes McCartney has been studying submarines for years. 
For him, identifying the many sunken U-boats around the coast of Britain is an absolute passion. In recent years, in UK coastal waters, submarines have been showing up all over the place. And a cursory glance into the official record of losses, both British and German, will soon tell you whether it's a known loss, one, one that was actually witnessed to sink uh, at the time, or you're into a mystery. This particular submarine is a mystery and there's a process we can go through to try and work out which one it is. And that follows both forensics, uh, actually visiting the site, trying to identify the class and date of the submarine, and then taking that back through archival records to come up with an explanation for how it ended up where it is. At the time that this submarine was located, it didn't fit into any of the published lost registers that exist for both British and German submarines. In fact, there are, there are no submarine losses recorded anywhere near that position. The wreck is raising far more questions than answers. Time for further investigation. The damage we're looking at is here. Right. Always lying on the side there. What have we got? A detailed sonar survey of the site may yield more clues. Sound passes through water easily. As it is towed, the sonar array sends out sound waves. The echoes build a detailed picture of what is down there. Today's side scan sonar generates far more information and more detail than its wartime predecessors could. The first results are encouraging. Uh, this... So we're we so trying to do a side pass here, or are we trying to pass it We're going to go through the middle, we're getting ambitious here. Okay. However, even now, how far down the contact is, how close the scanner is, the speed and angle at which it passes over the wreck all affect the end result. 90 meters away. Squeezing out every drop of information is as much an art as a science. Can you clock it another 10 degrees? Tweaking the toe should sharpen the image. 120 meters to run. Bill Smith's years of experience pay off. Innes gets vital information with which to plan a further dive. Oh, no, right, there's one wreck. Right. Which side is it on? Left. That's looks like a U-boat. Ah, yeah. oh, it's the whole thing. It's the whole thing, yeah, it's a conning tower. Right. That looks like one end. It's certainly cigar shape. Oh, look at the dent. Yeah. Must be laid over on its starboard side, is it? Port side. Port side. There's your collier. What's the distance between the two, then? I'd guess. 60 metres. We're trying to look for some forensic evidence of how the submarine is likely to have sunk, although we do have some theories about that. And we're also going to look at some of the external features on the submarine, which should help us to determine, if we can, its approximate age. From the bow, we want to travel along the deck on the port side and have a look at the snorkel arrangement. Uh, it will help us date the submarine to hopefully within a few weeks of the time of its sinking. We want to have a look at some of the um, communications gear that we'd expect to see appended to the conning tower and after the conning tower we want to have a look at the anti-aircraft armament and after that we want to have a very good look at the, the damage area which is starboard side aft. Breathing a special mixture of gases because of the depth Innes and the others plan to spend 30 minutes on the wreck. This should give them enough time to video the details they need. It is vital that all their equipment is checked and checked again. Any problems at these depths could have serious, if not fatal, consequences. In any event to decompress safely, they must spend over an hour and a half ascending to the surface. Hey, the swimming pool's open! I've always found that submarines make very interesting wrecks. 
because they're usually largely intact because of the way submarines are constructed they tend to lie on the seabed in roughly the same way you'd see them when they were running on the surface and they're fairly small so you can get around the whole wreck and see everything but aside from all of that generally they've got a very interesting history appended to them As I've got into diving submarines over the years, I've come to learn that a great deal of the submarine wrecks in the waters around the United Kingdom don't fit into any logical history as we know it. So there are also mysteries, which I find most intriguing, and there is really nothing more satisfying than actually going to an, an unidentified wreck and working out what it is. And in the case of submarines, because of the, the role they played in the wars, it's usually a very interesting and very human story. Innes is convinced the nearby shipwreck is a red herring. For him, the damage is not due to ramming. But he understands why other divers think differently. That's a hell of a big dent in the side. You swim over it, but it's so easy to look at that and go, oh, that's got to have been caused by hitting, by being hit by something, you know? It's because of it, because the shape of it, the way it's scalloped in there, you know? 60 years on, a German submarine lies just seven miles off the Cornish coast. Untouched, unvisited, and unknown. No U-boat is recorded as lost here. So which one is it, and why is it here? As Germany battles to isolate Britain, the Allies employ increasingly effective measures to counter the submarine threat. More accurate sonar, interception of signals and codes, greater coordination with aerial reconnaissance, better use of depth charges. U-Boat Command can no longer send craft out on the surface for long periods. Their solution is the snorkel. Using a special new air intake, the U-Boats can now remain underwater for entire patrols. The presence of a snorkel tube in the wreck is a significant clue. It allows Innes McCartney to narrow his search. Well, this one still is in fairly good condition, as you can see. All the features around the top of the conning tower here are all there. Here's the attack periscope. Uh, it's the conning tower hatch there, which is open. It's the control pillar. This is the sky observation periscope. And here's the snorkel itself. And a ring in this position on the mast is indicative of the uh, Type 1 snorkel arrangement. And this is usually associated with submarines that have been sunk in the last few weeks of the war. So this is a very good dating item. Lead me to believe that this submarine has been lost in 1945. It's a significant leap forward in the investigation. To make further headway, Innes travels to Germany to examine the only intact Type 7C U-boat in the world, identical to the mystery submarine. On the shores of the Baltic, he teams up with German U-boat historian Axel Niesler. On uh, Type 7 U-boats, the, the stern is one area that generally you find is usually quite intact, and it's sort of the iconic view, isn't it, with the, the twin rudders and the uh, torpedo tube coming out between them. Oh, that's solid steel here. So all of the exterior features that generally tend to fall off as the, as the conning tower and the winter garden corrode has all ended up in a big pile on the seabed, literally where we're standing now, and it's in there that you know we were able to look for some of the interesting piping for the snorkel. These boats were not built for being comfortable to the crew. These were fighting machines. And with a normal crew of say between 45 and 50 men crammed into these boat, living conditions were horrible. Uh, imagine the stink 50 persons produce inside a U-boat pressure hull. And with all the noise generated both inside the boat and coming from outside, it is a horrible vision. This is a diesel compartment now, uh, which is separated by these two doors from the rest of the boat. It is cramped. Isn't yeah, it? it is rather cramped. Uh, Very cramped. And now we come to the heart of the boat, the control room. This is the ladder upstairs to the bridge. Where the attack periscope is used. Right, and the uh, conning tower. And here we have 
The control panels for the hydrophone. Imagine rough weather with heavy sea. The whole boat is rolling like this all the time, 24 hours a day. So it's not one of the uh, easiest jobs to do service in here. U-boat design on the inside remained more or less unchanged throughout the war. But it is out on the deck that the key to Germany's changing U-boat tactics is to be found. So when this uh, snorkel was in use, it rose up into the vertical position and fitted into the, the conning tower behind us. That's right, rising up to periscope height. And uh, because the snorkel was used together with the periscope while the boat was snorkeling, the periscope was used to observe the sky in order to uh, avoid uh, being surprised by aircraft. And it was used to be able to, so they could run the diesel engines while the boat was submerged. Yeah, without the snorkel, these inshore operations in 1944-45 wouldn't have been possible. The search now takes a dramatic new twist. Astonishingly, two more unidentified submarines have been found only a few miles away. Could there be any connection between these three wrecks? First, they need to identify the new finds. Luckily, at 60 meters, nearly 200 feet, the first submarine is at the same depth as the original. There are other striking similarities. Her shape confirms that she too is German and of the same design, a Type 7C. She even displays that telltale feature of the late war U-boats, the snorkel. However, her damage is in a different area. The impact was catastrophic, totally shearing off the bow. To crush and twist the metal of a submarine's pressure hull, normally so robust, implies massive force. Memories haunt the sight. Rubber boots poke out from among the remaining metal, a clue to the horrific nature of the submarine's demise. Although the submarine is designed to operate entirely underwater, within a few weeks of it going down onto its final dive, it'll start to corrode. They are, after all, made of iron and steel, so they will rust. The thin metal that makes up the casing and the top deck, the fuel tanks, and a lot of the features around the conning tower has completely corroded away. So what we tend to see now on the seabed is the pressure hull and the center part of the conning tower with the rest of the features having fallen off and lying on the seabed next to the submarine. Just seven miles to the southwest, again at the same depth, and again lying on a port side, is the third submarine. Her shape too betrays her as German. Again, a late war model. And she seems to have suffered the same fate. The other submarine, too, has suffered um, catastrophic damage in the forward area, with the bow section being completely torn away. What is interesting is this wreck is a lot more corroded uh, than the other one. The submarine itself has broken down a lot more. And there's enough evidence on site for us to conclude that it is a late war Type 7 U boat. The divers are reaching these submarines just in time. In a mere handful of years, the features that allow them to identify individual boats will vanish, leaving only the anonymous solid metal of the pressure hull. With the three mystery submarines found within a few miles of each other, did they meet the same grisly end? They all share similar catastrophic damage. One may lie next to a ship, but that is more than likely just a complete coincidence. In order to discount ramming entirely, Innes needs to identify the individual submarines. By adding the evidence from the dives to his and Axel's search of British and German archives, they are on the brink of naming each of the three mystery U-boats. There were several boats operating in this area, but as far as we know, none of these boats was recorded as being lost in the Cornish area. But now having three wrecks off the coast of Cornwall, there is certainly reason to doubt these immediate post-war decisions. From the archive, they now have three firm candidates. Only by diving and recording more footage for analysis can they determine which one is which. 
And so through diving and through a, a study of the forensics and the material that lies on each site, we try to identify each submarine. It's fortunate for us that there were very specific design differences between all three and by looking for specific features on all three sites we were able to satisfy ourselves that we, we'd been able to tell them apart. Here's the uh, ring float snorkel on the fore deck. there's the cutaway and actually right there is the, the, the round uh, snorkel head and uh, I kind of knew when I, when I saw that, that I was looking at something important because it's the only time I've ever seen one on a war loss I, I mean, I've seen some Operation Deadline but I've never seen one on a submarine that's been lost in action before so I knew it was important and... Yeah, it's a key element in identifying this boat as 325 because the, it is the only one of these three boats which carried this kind of snorkel head. Yeah, I mean, it's a rare feature. Well, from uh, the, the details we have collected on the wrecks, comparing it with the details we have collected on the equipment of the wartime boats, we are pretty sure that there is 100% uh, uh, certainty in allocating individual boats to individual wrecks. Now they can positively identify all three U-boats for the first time. U-400, last heard of in December 1944. U-1021, last heard of in March 1945. And U-325, last heard of in April 1945. Now a new, deeper mystery beckons. Official records list all these submarines as sunk elsewhere. It is time to discover the secret that lies behind their brutal destruction. Off the coast of Cornwall, Three unidentified U-boats are now named by submarine experts Innes McCartney and Axel Niesler. U-400 disappears in December 1944. U-1021 is lost in March 1945. And U-325 becomes a victim in the very last week of the war. British records list these submarines as sunk elsewhere. The mystery deepens. Why are they here? In the early days of World War II, few submarines troubled the Cornish coast or the Bristol Channel. They stalk their prey far out in the Atlantic. In 1944, this changes. No one knows better than the commander of U-413, Knight's Cross holder, Gustav Poole. Our old tactic was to gather several U-boats on the surface. They would try to sail in front of a convoy, then dive for the attack. Heavy air cover made that no longer possible. Also, the British had superior communications. On top of that, they had cracked our codes. It became open season for them to hunt us down. So I wasn't at all surprised to be told no more missions in the North Atlantic. Instead, attack along the coast. My orders were to intercept the coastal convoys taking war material to the channel ports. An enemy target has to be worth the trouble. There's no point dying for the sake of a tramp steamer with a couple of crew and a few tons of freight. That's stupid. Because the U-boat, as long as it exists, represents a greater threat than just managing to sink a small ship of a few hundred tons. When the right target presented itself, Poole was prepared to take a gamble. 180 feet down is the result. This is all that remains of a destroyer, HMS Warwick. In February 1944, she set out to track down a U-boat. On board was navigation officer David Harris. 
we were advised that it was believed a submarine was operating off Land's End and we were to sail immediately in company with HMS Scimitar to search for her. The U-boat was believed to be operating in the area, sighted us. The hunter became the hunted. We could hear Astic, but he didn't come towards us. He steamed in front of us. I'd estimate she was less than a thousand meters away when I fired. There was a very big explosion down aft, followed shortly afterwards by the biggest explosion I've ever seen at close quarters. The ship rolled over to port. From start to finish, it was less than three minutes for the ship had gone. It was obvious with the stern missing, the ship was going to go down. It was how long would it stay afloat? The thought in the mind was get away from the ship as quickly as possible, otherwise you're liable to be taken down by the suction. I heard a few calls for help, but once I got away from the ship, I didn't see anybody at all. Out of a crew of 130, 68 men go down with the ship. After the shot, I saw that she was listing. Straight away, I lowered the periscope, and then we heard the creaking and cracking as the ship sank. We call it bursting. The Warwick is the last ship Gustav Poole was to sink. His success reinforces U-Boat Command's belief that their submarines can still affect the outcome of the war. The inshore campaign begins in earnest, triggering the events that lead to the presence of the three submarine wrecks on the seabed today. Innes McCartney is confident the identities of the sunken submarines are correct. But what took them to the bottom? For a professional analysis of the damage, he plans to measure the impact area behind the conning tower on U-325. The damage zone proves to stretch more than 9 meters, 30 feet in diameter. Innes is increasingly convinced that the damage on all three submarines was caused by the same thing. So what actually sank these submarines? Depth charges? Torpedoes? Bombs? Shells? Mines or even ramming? Close scrutiny of the debris could provide the solution. If, you, if the submarine was upright and level... Doug Wright and David Manley are defence explosive experts. They have spent years researching damage to naval warships. You get a nice view of the hole there, with the actual amount of where the, the, you see where the pressure hull's missing. Yeah, and you can see the split, look, yeah. right across, mm -hmm. like right there. So that's just... just the blast has gone off, it's just opened it up, right, hasn't it? it? just cracked it straight through. The only way we'd have achieved that by some form of collision was if the submarine was sitting right up in this, out of the water at the time. Yeah, yeah. Ramming? Certainly not. Um, depth charges, not impossible. The charge weight is not that dissimilar, but given you're dropping a depth charge off the back of a ship, hoping to drop it somewhere around about the submarine, the actual probability you're going to drop it right on top of it and detonate it next to the hull is very small. For an underwater explosion, you've got a, a massive event going off fairly close to the boat. And although in terms of pressure hull, we're talking about nearly an inch of steel. If you think about that in terms of, you know, what's on your car or something like that, you think, well, it's you know, a fantastically rigid piece of structure, but against this sort of uh, attack, it just folds up like paper. 
But it almost certainly rode over a mine. And we can see it's, a, it's at least a £340 mine charge that's caused that amount of damage, maybe up to the 500 Difficult to tell because of the amount of material that's not there. In the early part of the war, many areas of the sea around the British Isles are mined as a measure to prevent the use of certain strategic areas by shipping. Tens of thousands of mines are laid. Mine laying is by definition an unspectacular operation, unless you're being attacked while you're doing it. You came to a particular position and then you dropped the mines on their sinkers over the back of the ship, splash, 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 splash. And then the mines rose from their sinkers on the cables to the required depth. You then checked whether any were too high up. If they were, you had to sweep them, deal with them, and then you left the field in wait for its prey. Just such a field lies in wait between the southwest of England and the coast of Ireland. It is a defense against shipborne invasion. These mines float near the surface. They are well marked. Both sides are fully aware of their existence. Any submarine would steer clear of these lethal hazards. Could three U-boats really run into mines in a known safe area? Innes is not held by the fact that when a submarine is sunk by a mine, it often goes unnoticed and unrecorded. And after the war, the full story of Britain's mine-laying strategy is kept secret. But searching in the Royal Navy archives, Innes finally finds clues to what may have happened. The information that we've been able to get here today, which was classified until fairly recently, actually details specifically where the lines of mines were laid along this part of the Cornish coast during the last year of the war. On this uh, chart here of the western approaches to the Bristol Channel, we can see the red box, which was the declared minefield that existed from 1940 right through to the end of the war. Running along the North Cornish coast, we have what was known as the Southern Gap, which convoys would use coming up from the southwest. The U-boats had knew of the existence of this Southern Gap, and so in the event they were likely to be operating in this area, they would be targeting the North Cornish coast as an area to torpedo ships. With the intelligence information that came the Allies' way, the strategy was to lay a deep anti-U-boat minefield right across the Southern Gap. The lines of mines were laid at a depth of 70 feet below the water so that the convoys traversing that area could pass quite safely over the top of the mines. But any U-boat uh, submerged entering that area looking for targets is going to go into a minefield. The recently declassified document reveals a secret operation. The Admiralty orders deep mines to be laid across the Southern Gap starting in November 1944. The positions of the wrecked U-boats and of these mines coincide exactly. Innes can safely conclude that the subs are all victims of the deadly trap. We know that the strategic thinking here was exactly bang on because we now have three mining casualties in the right place at the right time. I'm very satisfied that this material has led us to conclude successfully that mining has been the reason why these U-boats have sunk. Three mystery submarines are proving to be the keys to other secrets. They yield their true identities. Their positions give away their mission to destroy vital war supplies close inshore. Expert analysis of their damage confirms all three meet their end by mines. Added together, they are new, conclusive proof of the success of Britain's previously underrated mine-laying strategy. But why did the Germans fall into the trap? It's a very crafty operation. This. You're laying mines below the depth of surface shipping, 70 feet in this case. The only things you can kill are submarines on their nefarious business. And it's, it, it's quite a focused way of using the mine weapon. And it was extremely effective. The Mark 17 mines contain between 350 and 500 pounds of high explosive enough to sink a battleship. They detonate on contact with horns protruding from their casing. Against submarines, they are particularly lethal. A surface ship, you'll blow a big hole in the bottom. A submarine might blow the whole bows off. 
And of course, the smaller the target, the more catastrophic the damage. You can sink it with one blow. The, the, the blast area on the wreck of the U-325 is a semicircular impression that has been cut right into the, the side of the submarine, well over halfway through the pressure hull, going right across from about the end of where the bandstand is, right back to almost where the prop shafts come out. And so you can see it's maybe 30 feet or more wide, and it's gone way over halfway through. So it's a, a singular event that has just completely destroyed the submarine. There was no chance for the crew because the pressure hull was widely destroyed and the inrush of water was so immense, so the boat was flooded within a moment. On the, uh, the wreckers of 1021 and the 400, we've got the forward section lying completely off and then a big gaping hole in this area. And I think the mine's likely to have detonated at the point where the, the keel here starts to rise, just about where I'm standing. And the force of the explosion has completely torn off the, the bow section. So this is quite heavy because of the weight of the torpedoes and the torpedo tube. So gravity alone would have, would have finished off whatever the blast did and it's just torn it off completely. The details of these U-boats' last voyages have now finally come to light. And with their identities and the reasons why they were sunk now firmly established, their last voyages can be pieced together. By this stage of the war, most German U-boats are operating out of Norway. It is from here that these three submarines are dispatched. For two of their crews, it is their first patrol. For all three, it is to be their last. U-400, 18th of November, 1944, under Captain Horst Kreutz. U-1021, 20th of February, 1945, Captain William Holpert. U-325, 20th of March, 1945, Captain Irvin Dorn. None of them had any idea they were sailing into a trap. When any of our three submarines along the Cornish coast left Norway and shut the hatch, that wasn't opened again until they expected to get back home. So by the time our boats arrived in the Cornish area, they had been underwater for two or more weeks. Quite often you'd get very high concentrations of carbon dioxide. People would have raging headaches a lot of the time, disorientation. It's possible they weren't thinking absolutely as clearly as they were the day they got into the boat. The route of the U-boats takes them round the north of Scotland and down the west coast of Ireland. As well as suffering physically, they are in a constant state of tension. It is always the stress which is superimposed on this by the, the threat uh, from being killed. The kill could be instantly, either from the air or from surface craft dropping depth charges. And I wonder if this is a stress which could be taken at the extended period of time. On the 4th of December 1944, Captain Kreutz receives U-400's last orders. He is to proceed to Cornwall to intercept coastal convoys. Little does he know, only a week earlier off Padstow, a British mine layer has covertly laid a line of 150 deep mines below that very same convoy route. The trap is set. They've practically run over the mines. So the first they would have known of the mine was when it blew. They might have heard a scrape or a crack, but that's about it. If you knew there is mines, you wouldn't enter this area at all, because mines are very, very dangerous. You can see them, and once you hit them, you are done for. A month later, U-400 is reported missing. No one then knows her true fate or location. After the war, British records list her as destroyed by a frigate off the Irish coast. When Captain Holpert of U-1021 arrives off Ireland in 1945, he little suspects that the British have secretly laid deep mines off the Cornish coast. His last orders are received on the 8th of March. His nemesis had been laid three months earlier on the 3rd of December. On 
the 14th of March, a British steamer in the area reports hearing a loud explosion. This previously unexplained event is probably the last moments of U-1021. At the time, her loss is attributed to an action 500 miles to the north, off the coast of Scotland. Late in the war, the disappearance of these two U-boats fails to arouse any suspicions at U-boat command. They are completely oblivious to the trap. In particular, to a line of mines laid on the 12th of December. On the 10th of April, they order Captain Irvin Dawn to patrol Cornish waters. Whether he goes to the north or south is up to him. He chooses the north. Three two five was obviously in between the mines, and was turning, or trying to drift backwards or forwards. She was manoeuvring. Did it realise it fell the cable? Was it hoping to reverse out? Was it trying to turn when it was there? But yes, there's a possibility there. They knew that they were in the minefield and they were trying to get themselves out. massive shockwave has come right in and travelled throughout the submarine. Uh, in a few seconds, it's just completely destroyed. So even if this door had been closed, it might have been forced open by the sheer force of the explosion. Mm, I would think so. Also yeah. swamping all these compartments uh, within a matter of seconds. Uh, must have been hell on hers. Unimaginable. The chances of anybody surviving that for any length of time is minimal. Chances are they all died almost immediately. U-325's loss is initially attributed to two Royal Navy destroyers, 200 miles to the north, in the channel between Wales and the Isle of Man. Only now can her actual fate be confirmed. There is nobody who can tell us about these final moments on a boat being sunk but certainly it's not something we could choose as the best way to die. Innes McCartney is satisfied to have put numbers to the three submarines for the first time. He is saddened to realize that now he can also put names to the 40 or 50 men on board each one. A trip to the U-boat memorial in Kiel with Axel Niesler allows him to see the extent of the losses. The walls record each U-boat lost in action, their last known position, the names and dates of birth of the missing. Their ages are remarkably young. The commander here, he was barely 25 when the boat was sunk and um, the crew therefore would have been even younger than him. And was 25, he was the old hand aboard. The normal crew is, is uh, around 21 at average. Obergefreiter Ubo Wilms was just 19 when he joined the crew of U-400 for its first and only mission. It is the first of the three U-boats to be sunk off Cornwall in December 1944. To his nephew, also named Ubo, the location of the wreck comes as a complete surprise. U-400 was actually ordered to come down from Norway, to come down this way. Mm -hmm. And on the 4th of December, a radio signal was sent to the submarine, ordering it to operate on the North Cornish coast. That is something new. We didn't know that. We always believed that it happened what the British authorities told us, and that it wasn't caused by mines, but by a destroyer. We always believed that the boat sank as in this report. 
In 1948, it said that my uncle Ubo had been lost on the 17th of December 1944. The boat is supposed to have gone down south of Ireland. There is no possibility of U-400 being in that area at that time. I can only say that his death still affects me to this day because he was my uncle. It's just a pity his parents never knew where he died and now never will. William Holpert was the captain of the second submarine to sink, U-1021. A keen photographer, he has left behind a fascinating archive of U-boat life. Today, this comprehensive photographic record is in the care of his nephew's wife. This is William. On the bridge of his uh, submarine. Yeah. Here he is on the uh, back of the winter garden. She too is perplexed by the fact that the U-boat's fate was recorded incorrectly. But why? At the beginning, don't you have to know where they shot at the boats and where the mines were? I think it is interesting that it's been found. It was thought that they would never be discovered again. And I think it is fantastic that the boat has been found. U-325 was the last submarine of the three submarines to be sunk by the secret minefield. Her captain, Irvin Dorn, was just 25. He joined the Navy at 18. Four years later, he married Margareta. They had a son, Hans Heinrich. When Dorn took command of U-325 in 1943, it was a proud moment. His widow recalls when she last saw him. March 1945. On the 5th of March, my husband went to Berlin to make a report and then back to Bergen to rejoin his crew. Then they left on their second patrol. After that, she heard nothing. I didn't find out anything until 1947. Then I got a letter from the British authorities. Sixty years on, the news of the loss of her husband still haunts her. He was proud and happy that he had achieved what he wanted. But of course, I wasn't very happy about the U-boat thing. I would have preferred him to remain ashore. But there were so many of them, so many. During the Second World War, more than 40,000 men set out on U-boats. Fewer than 10,000 were to return. The Allies' success in sinking U-boats, including the use of deep trap minefields, had turned them from weapons of terror into underwater coffins. Now the three submarines can be identified after all these years. The bereaved can at last know what really happened and where their loved ones died. Ubo Wilms never expected to be able to pay his last respects to his missing uncle. With members of his family, he and Innes traveled the 17 miles out to the site of the sinking for a memorial service. Following the catastrophic collision in the minefield, all the crewmen of these U-boats lost their lives. And even today, mankind has still not yet learned anything from these events. For this reason, we remember all the seamen of the world, irrespective of whether they come from Germany, England, Canada, France, or any other country. <laughs> 
Often the families of those who perish at sea have no opportunity to pay their respects to their loved ones where they died. For the crews of these three submarines at least, their final resting place has at last been found.